2020 had even the most chill of us feeling some kind of way. And if it isn't us feeling anxiety, it's definitely somebody that we love. And whether the anxiety is pre-existing or the new 2020 edition, how do we support the ones we love who are living with it? My next guest is a licensed mental health counselor who is going to walk us through it and react and respond to some comments listeners have actually received. Married 14 years and still has a baby face. (laughs) <laughs> Pensacola to New Jersey and back again. Personal growth mediator, Jake Davis. Hello. Thanks for coming. No, no, thanks for having me. So can we start by defining anxiety? When it's helpful, when is it not helpful? Well, anxiety is actually supposed to be something that's good for you. Uh, it's that whole fight or flight response. Uh, but for some folks, it's a little bit more intense and over- overwhelming for others. It's fear. It's worry. It's a whole bunch of things wrapped in uh, to a great big ball. And then we've got a ball of nerves. It's a lot of things. And it could be in many forms. There's multiple different anxiety disorders. So so it's okay on. when people are like, I have anxiety and they just use it as a general term because it's not incorrect. Correct. I mean, until it's actually, they see someone and they actually figure out the correct diagnosis, whether it's generalized anxiety disorder, whether it's OCD. I mean, even PTSD is a, an anxiety disorder, you know, and then you got a little bit higher and you go to the panic disorder where folks mm-hmm. are having full blown panic attacks. So, so there's different flavors. Yeah. It's a lot of, uh, cognitive distortions, irrational thought processes, uh, intrusive thoughts, getting in your head too much and not being able to break away from those fears and worries. Hmm. So it, it, it ends up, uh, causing some issues with your daily functioning, uh, could be mild, could be severe. Yeah. I always thought that if you said I have anxiety, that meant automatically it was a a severe type and that otherwise you're supposed to use like a different word, but that's not the case. Mm -mm. I mean, we discussed before every, for the most part, everybody's got some form of anxiety, whether it's, you know, they're dealing with a stressful situation or they're not. It, it could come out of nowhere or there could be a specific stressor that triggers it. You know, it's for the most part, everybody's got it. It's just some have it a little bit worse than others. And I think the statistic right now is one in three right now are suffering some sort of, you know, debilitating problem. From anxiety. One in three. One in three. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. Is that just the U.S. or is that everybody? Right now, I believe it's global, but let's just stick with the U.S. because we seem to have it higher than some other areas because it's it's more out there in the U.S. compared to others. You know, it's still stigmatized in some other areas of the country. So right. So when does anxiety become a problem within relationships? Like, what's the threshold? Let's see, there's, really becomes a problem whenever the one that's not having it doesn't know what to do with it. They will, they don't understand it. So usually the best thing for them is to educate themselves on it and understand the other person's perspective, what they're worrying about, what their triggers are, and supporting them. But uh, when it becomes problematic, it's, you know, of course, there's going to be arguing, we're going to see it different perspectives, you know, for me, uh, you know, Amy will be happy. She'll be fine with me talking about it. She's got anxiety, my wife, I've had anxiety. So it's fine for us Mm -hmm. because I've dealt with it before and she's dealing with it now mildly. You know, she didn't start having it until kids came and now she's got a whole new set of worries to worry about all the time. And then now we got COVID and we got remote learning. Oh my gosh. So it's been a challenge. I like to call her. remote learning drinking from home. A <laughs> day drinking. Yeah. Day drinking. That that's uh I've come home to her with a glass of wine a couple times. <laughs> so that's accurate. Uh there's a number of things that you know to look for, you know, irritability, you know, uh if your significant other is having trouble sleeping, they're restless, they're antsy, talking to them. Figuring out what's going on. Those are going to be the things that you want to do. You, you, you don't want to make it about y'all. You want to make it about the anxiety. 
Mm. So, so that it's not like a blame thing. Correct. There's no blame to throw around you. Your brain's very complex and sometimes it's going to play tricks on you and that's what, that's what it's doing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's important to support and ask important questions like, what can I do for you? That's going to make, it's going to make you feel better. Yeah. So I think, um, like as I was saying off mic earlier, for me personally, it's been something that I have been reluctant to name Mm -hmm. because I always was taught if you name it, you give it power and then it, whenever you focus on grows. And so it's been kind of this, uh, dancing act of where, uh, like I'll say, Oh, I had a, I had an anxiety moment. Like I'm not going to call that an attack. So I'm like, I didn't hyperventilate. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I realized that through that process of, you know, finding a name for it that, uh, not being aware of it would definitely contribute to a relationship conflict because Mm -hmm. if one person's like, well, what's wrong with you? And the other person's reluctant to name it, like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh yeah. Communication's going to be huge. You know, being forthcoming with with your partner, whoever it may be. I mean, you say loving someone with anxiety. Is it necessarily a significant other? Is it a family member? Is it a child? Mm -hmm. Are we going the whole spectrum of it, or are we just sticking to like loved ones as far as significant others? For today, um, I think, you know, I think based on comments that I've gotten back from listeners, it's people, their partners, their romantic partners. Gotcha. Um, But I think, uh, I'm hoping some of the tips that you give would be applicable to co-workers or um, other people that we come across in during the day. Okay. Um, in fact, I, I do have some comments that listeners have received from people. I saw some. <laughs> there was only like 140. Yeah. No big deal. Just, no big just deal. a little bit. Don't worry. We're not going to go through all 140. Sure. I kind of put them into categories, so I would love your response and okay. then maybe what uh, the, the person, the partner could say or do instead. And then I, I see that you brought notes too. So I d- definitely don't let me, um, yeah, just a skip few, over just a few do's and, <laughs> just a few do's and don'ts. Okay, great. So I think one we, that was, it was a big common one was, uh, blame. And some of the comments under that category were, why are you acting crazy? You're overreacting. Quit trying to make things all about you. This one was really bad. Mm -hmm. I can never plan anything nice for you because I never know which version of you I'm coming home to. That one's kind of better, but it's still throwing blame. You know, uh, I usually recommend if, if, if your significant other is in counseling for anxiety, speak to them, ask them if they can, if you can attend with them work on some communication skills with them in those sessions. Uh, I statements are huge. Whenever you say you, 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 you're, you're pointing the finger, you're blaming. So working on I statements, like I feel like I can't ever plan anything because you're having whatever issue may, you, you may be having with anxiety. And that frustrates me. There's no blame there. That's, mm-hmm. that's me. That's how I feel. Mm-hmm. What can I do that's going to help you overcome whatever fear or worry that you're having to where we can get to a point to where you can get out? Because now you're talking maybe a social phobia, maybe, Mm. you know, and a lot of times social phobia, a lot of that is just experience pushing your boundaries a little bit more, going out a little bit more, bigger crowds, bigger crowds, because we've got to get our mind wrapped around the fact that there's nothing to worry about. You know, I, I dealt with that for a while back in my early 20s. I didn't want to go out anywhere. My life's kind of been a roller coaster. I've I've been really extroverted, introverted, extroverted, introverted. And right now, just as we were discussing earlier, I've been more introverted lately. I'm I'm not as social as I used to be. There's no worry there. That's just kind of comes with the territory with being a therapist sometimes as I talk all day, every day. And Sometimes I'm just worn out from talking, mm-hmm. but I enjoy socializing. You know, uh, we went to a wedding this past weekend or last weekend it was great. Enjoyed myself, but few and far between it happens. I'm, I'm kind of a homebody now and that's fine. It's, it has nothing to do with my anxiety, but for some people it is, it's, I can't go out because of A, B, or C. Whatever it may be. So understanding your, your significant other's worries, their fears, 
and trying to support them and not make it about the anxiety. You know, you know we're fighting this together. We're not, you know, I'm not going to fight with you. You're not going to fight with me because it's going on that. Setting good boundaries. Because I have noticed, and Amy, I'm sorry, uh, but sometimes whenever Amy's anxiety gets ramped up, and for the most part, maybe the listeners will understand as well, is your mouth runs faster than your brain whenever anxiety is going. So sometimes mm-hmm. things will be said that you can take personally, and it's important to not take it personally whenever you identify my, signif- my significant other is having one of those anxiety moments. Don't take it personally, whatever name they just called you. Hmm. Let, try to let it roll off because that's it's very important for the lover of the anxiety struggles is take care of yourself, practice self-care for yourself, educate yourself, provide support, and listen. Those are like the biggest things you can do for somebody. Don't tell them, get over it. Don't tell them, calm down. That's the worst you can do is mm-hmm. calm down. If they could calm down, they would. For sure. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's so easy for you, me to say calm down now because I know how to manage it now. Right. Do you feel like um, a proper diagnosis is, like, is it essential? Because you said, um, you know, you mentioned some social anxiety there. Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned at the beginning, there's, like, anxiety is this big umbrella. And then under that umbrella lives all of these um, flavors mm-hmm. of anxiety and some of them are mild and some of them are strong. And if one of them is social interactions, but the person isn't aware of it, is it possible to have a healthy relationship without that person being aware of what their flavor of anxiety is? I think it's possible, but at the same time, it why not find out what the diagnosis is? Yeah. At least go get checked out. At least go get assessed. Speak with someone. Doesn't have to be for months and months. You know, maybe if you just wanted that peace of mind just to get the diagnosis there and figure out what exactly it is. Is it OCD? Is it anxiety? Is it a social phobia? Whatever it may be, at least you now have something to go with, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, they'll be able to, Myself or any other therapist will be able to help you gauge the severity of it. How how severe is it? Because we go on our diagnosis, we go uh, based off of severity for the most part. I mean, uh, based on how I schedule, I, I will see you probably more often if I feel it's more severe and more debilitating. And hopefully we make progress and then we taper off. Mm-hmm. You know, so it is, I think, important to get an understanding of what is going on because without it, you you don't know how to cope with it. You don't know the strategies that you're going to be able to utilize to help heal because Mm -hmm. that's really all what we're trying to do is heal and grow. And if you've got a significant other that's counterproductive to that, we're going to continue to have problems. And if it's treatment resistant, um, then let's say there's a couple and it's a treatment resistant anxiety. So he or she is on medication, maybe even seeing a therapist and trying to use some, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy skills, some mm-hmm. executive function skills, but there is still that life interrupting anxiety that causes a constant, um, just interruption of plans or, um, conversation or, you know, maybe the couple can't ever bring up the topic of finances or make a decision together because the anxiety is just always there. What, what can two people in that situation do? Well, again, going back to the counseling aspect of it is attending sessions with them, finding out what our triggers are. Is it finance? Talking about finances. If it is, then we discuss strategies and communication strategies in session that's going to help us bring home mm. and focus on them there. You know, not a, I'm not a perfect communicator, are you? Uh, no. no. So, <laughs> Should we text Garrett real quick I and know. ask? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So learning some good communication skills in those sessions for helping facilitate a a conversation with someone that has anxiety specifically about things that worry them finances health 
the future, whatever、mm-hmm. it may be, you know, s- topics to really hone in on and really learn what's going to upset them, what's going to get their anxiety to go from zero to a hundred really fast. Different ways to communicate to them without that anxiety going up,、mm. you know. So you're not saying don't not talk about in this example finances. Anxiety is not a pass to never do the thing or talk about the thing, well, but、correct. instead you know, maybe approach it differently. Yeah. Well, the, another big thing with you know s- someone that is in a relationship with what, somebody with anxiety, you can't enable them. You're when you dismiss or if you kind of bypass conversations for the sake of not upsetting them, you're enabling them. They've got to be able to have these talks. The more they have these talks, the easier it will get. You know, it's it's a matter of like you know, I've I've allowed myself to get to the point from however way I got there, and now I'm back at the beginning on how to have a tough conversation, how to get out and about and be around people, whatever those worries are. It's kind of like we're an infant again, and we got to grow, and we've got to learn how to do it again. And without having that experience, all you're doing is prolonging it. I could definitely see why a third party would be so helpful because as you're talking, I'm imagining you know these characters, and I could really see how the romantic relationship could become have way too much of a parent child relationship if there's not a third person in there going, hey, you know, this is what we do next. This is、mm-hmm. our next step. This is you know, how do you feel about that?、Um, I could see where that would become. They would really disintegrate the relationship. Yeah, and like I said, I mean, anxiety can come in many different forms. It can come about in many different ways. Trauma being one of them. You know, I've had you know couples in there where you know there was a lot of anxiety around cheating. You know, they'd have, "Can I see your phone? I think you're doing something, whatever it may be." And what do you do there? How 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 often do you just give them the phone? You know, at, at first, yeah, sure, give it to them, let them see it, let them see that you're not doing anything that you shouldn't be doing. Hopefully, provide some reassurances there. But at one point, do you say, you know what, enough's enough? We've been doing this for months. I've been giving you my phone. It's time to stop that. Yeah. You know, now it's time for me to start being a little bit more assertive with how I'm speaking to you. A little bit more boundaries. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to enable you anymore because all we're doing is again prolonging it. You've got to be able to stand on your own two feet. I'm going to be here to support you, and I'm going to try to my best to support you in every way I can. You know, it's it's tough. I'm not saying this is easy. It's way way easier said than done. Totally. You know, and it can be stressful. That's why I stress self care. Take、mm-hmm. care of yourself. Educate educate yourself on the topic. Go to these sessions with them if if you can. You know, it's it's. I've seen relationships end because of it because they just couldn't do it anymore, and it's、yeah. un- it's it's unfortunate. It really is because if they would have done these things sooner, they'd probably be still together. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the other、uh, comments that I heard was、um, my least favorite is the spiritual one,、mm-hmm. and so I would love for you to have a. What should we say instead? But it was、uh, just pray about it, or you know, the Bible mentions worry so many times. Meditate, say a prayer. Meditation is great, though. You know,、uh, the spiritual side of it it can be really healing. You know, we I go over grounding methods in in my sessions, and I recommend meditation. I recommend you know some guided imagery there. I recommend. Yoga. I mean, all these things are good practices for self care, and self care is going to help a lot. But it's not going to solve everything,、right. you know.、Uh, pray about it. If that provides you some comfort, sure. But、yeah. it's not going to solve it. And coming from that person that is like, you know, you're in a say, you know, it, you're my brother, and your anxiety is interrupting my life. If I'm like, just pray about it. That's Has a different tone than, like you actually going. Hmm, maybe I should meditate. Yeah, well,、uh, from the perspective of the person with anxiety, it, it, 
that's going to come across as you just dismissing it. Yeah, just, dismissive. Just go pray about it. I think anytime you start the phrase with the word just, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, mm-hmm. it's like just nails on a chalkboard. Yeah. I love what you said about starting with I. Mm-hmm. So that's a great thing for us to remember, whether it's a romantic partner or a sibling or a fam- you know, some kind of family member. Start with the word I and then the feeling and then Yeah, well, instead of like, on. you know, go pray about it, like, hey, what do you feel about praying? Do you feel that's going to be beneficial to you? Have a discussion about it. Just don't, you, you can't tell somebody with any anxiety what to do because unless you've dealt with it yourself. Yeah. And even then I've dealt with it myself. I don't go tell Amy, get over it. Just calm down. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a lot, I lied about that. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I get a little frustrated. <laughs> I'll like, be like, I'm not perfect. Bro, she's listening. She's yeah. listening. <laughs> uh, we'll tell her to calm down. But it's in those moments. Like it's, we're yeah. not going to be perfect, yeah. you know? Again, I'm not perfect. I'll apologize. Sometimes Amy probably will say, no, I don't. But I try. Because, yeah. you know, I want her to get better. And she's she's doing great for the most part. I mean, she's killing the remote learning and all that stuff. And it's still stressful. And I have to put myself in her shoes because sometimes I'll come home and she is stressed out. And I'm like, you're, you're stay-at-home mom. You're, like, doing all this stuff. You're just chilling. And I'm like, really, I've, I've stayed home a couple times and she is totally not chilling. So for all you, like, remote teachers out there, more power to you. <laughs> she is so. totally not chilling. No. <laughs> well, I've, 30 minutes is just flying by. And I don't want to leave behind the... Uh, information that you brought there. Is there any other tips or um, strategies that you can share for people who are loving those with anxiety? Uh, we've tackled a few of them. I mean, I've just got a few bullets, you know, to really, hopefully you can take everything seriously whenever I say these things. Uh, as far as loving someone with anxiety, trying your best not to criticize them for having anxiety. They're already doing themselves a disservice with the negative self-criticism that they have for themselves. They don't need you adding on to it. Uh, don't ever dismiss their anxiety. Whether you feel it's fake or not, it's not up to you to decide. It's If it's them, and let's just say they are faking it, what are they faking it for? Are they doing it for attention? Aside, just I would never say you're faking it because that's just going to make it worse whether they have it or not. It's Don't do that. Uh, Is that, do you think that's the worst thing that you could say? Could very well top of the list, very yeah. close to top of the list, because again, do I op- occupy a space in your brain? No, you don't occupy a space in my brain, so you can't tell me what I'm thinking. You can't tell me what I'm doing. Uh, that's that's for me to decide. And yeah, if you are faking it, it's, it's, it's time to assess and you know evaluate why am I faking it? What am I looking to gain from it? But for the most part, I don't, I don't, I don't see too many people that are faking it. I mean, mm. I, I really don't see. Aside from attention, I don't see anything to gain from faking anxiety. How about y'all? Do you, do y'all prefer to have anxiety or not? I mean, it's a pretty easy question. I've dealt with it myself, and I don't wish it upon anybody. Right. You know, mine was all the way up to panic attacks, like mm. daily, and daily those, panic attacks, daily panic attacks. So. Going back to the bullets that I got. Uh, Do not try to be their therapist. Mm. Leave that for the professionals. Stay away from WebMD. (laughs) Uh, If you are going to go to a site, you know, go to something like Psychology Today. There's some pretty good scholarly articles that you may find there. Uh, If you are going to try to really find something, look for more, you know, journal articles that are coming from, you know, medical journals, psychology journals. Uh, Again, going back to don't take everything personally because the minute you start taking everything personally, argument. My emotions go here. You match. I raise you. You match. I raise you. And then <laughs> learn to walk away. You know, it's yeah. okay to say time out. I'm going to go calm down. You go calm down. And we'll revisit this in like 20 or 30 minutes when we have cool heads. Because mm-hmm. once you've got those negative emotions in your conversation, it's all downhill from there. There's there's usually no recovering from that. I could see where building in a strategy as a couple would be really helpful too. Because again, <laughs> it, so the space that's in my head, it always has little movies happening. So mm-hmm. now you know that about me. No. Um, not that surprising, I suppose. <laughs> but um, So I'm picturing these people arguing and they're, they're like 
okay, well, time out. But then they're about to leave the house. Like, mm-hmm. they have somewhere to go. And then it ruins the whole day. And then there's resentment and all that. So in my mind, I was thinking I could see where creating some extra padding, like sure. a margin of error around um, decisions that need to be made or, um, you know, getting ready for maybe if it's a social anxiety, a social event, I could totally see where that would be necessary because if you don't, then it's just like this continual cycle mm-hmm. of it has to be perfect or it's ruined. Yeah. No, it's, it's I, I 100% agree there. It's, you know, you want that padding there, but you, again, going back to we want to kind of push them along, you know, mm-hmm. let's try it. You know, we're going to go. And if we only stay 10 minutes and we only stay 10 minutes, I'll go home with you and that's fine. But going back to like the, the argument there, you know, if, if we just got into an argument and we say time out, but I've got to go to work or something like that, say, look, we'll, we'll finish this discussion when we get home. I love you. Don't worry about it because I'm telling you, I'm not trying to, I'm not, I don't have any plans on leaving you, whatever it may be. Right, whatever Provide the them those in, in assurances there that, look, this is just a timeout. I'm a little upset, but it's something that I'll be more than happy to be free of by the time I get home. And then we'll revisit, revisit this discussion. Yeah. You know, we don't have to solve everything right now. And that's a pr- another issue that with folks with anxiety have is they, they're very impatient with it. Mm. They want it solved right now. Mm-hmm. And if it's not solved, it'll eat at them and eat at them and eat it. So you'll get those phone call after phone call after phone call. Talk to me, talk to me. Okay. I'll talk to you for like five minutes. And right. It's, it's all I can give you right now, but we've got to stop enabling them. Mm. And, Provide them some type of comfort. Whatever their worry is, what do you need to speak to me about? What are you What are you fearful of? What are you worried about? We'll talk about it. Hopefully I can reassure you that everything is going to be okay. You don't want to just say everything's going to be okay because that's, again, that's easier said than done. Right. Yeah, that was definitely one of the responses yeah. listeners you gotta got. you got to provide those assurances that everything's going to be okay. You can't just say it. Right. You know? <laughs> so be patient. It, it it does require a lot of patience, you know, and know your limits. You, that's like the biggest thing I can, you know, tell somebody is be patient, try to stay calm, try not to take things personally. They're dealing with a lot, even if it doesn't seem like a lot from your perspective, mm-hmm. they are. It's uh, from someone who's dealt with it myself, it's a lot and it takes time and therapy and working with them medication's great i know there's still a little stigma about medication but like i told you earlier if you got if you got a headache what do you take tylenol if you got you know muscle ache mm-hmm. you take tylenol whatever it may be there's all types of medications this medication isn't supposed to be a permanent thing anxiety isn't supposed to be a permanent thing yes there's no cure for it you learn how to manage it i've learned how to manage it i still have it but i know how to recognize it immediately mm-hmm. and get away from it you know, it, it's it's going to take some practice, and we can get better. Everybody can get better from this. That's I couldn't think of like a better way to wrap up this episode is just knowing that it's not a permanent state, Mm-mm. and that you can get better, and that uh, there's no long lasting uh, stigma or. No. Just that there's no permanence around it is so hopeful. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. A lot of times it's just, you know, a stage we go through. Mm-hmm. You know, so, yeah, no, thank you. This was great. Well, well if you're listening or watching to this and you want to um, get in touch with Jake and his practice, that what's the website that they can go to? Uh, Santa Rosa Counseling Center dot com. Uh, we're up off Jones Street in Milton, uh, 5642 Jones Street. Uh, and... I'm there all the time, so a lot. (laughs) A lot. So if you're in the state of Florida, he is licensed to practice in the state of Florida. Outside of the state of Florida, um, I'll put some other resources in my Saturday email for you so that you're, if you're in a different country or just in a different state, that you're not left hanging either. But thank you again so much for coming. You did great. Hey, thank you. That's a wrap. All right.